Let's open our Bibles to the book of Philippians tonight. You know, I've been um, a student of the Word of God for over 45 years. And uh, a lot of the scriptures I have studied and meditated upon, they're just as alive today, if not more so than when I first began. That's the amazing thing about scriptures. It's uh, divinely inspired of God. All scripture, say all scripture. All scripture. all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So God's given us, I've always told people that the, the, the most amazing things we have is basically four things. We have the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and His Word. His Word. And if there's anything that the devil wants to keep you from hiding in your heart, it's the Word of God. David said, I've hid your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Uh, the scripture in your brain, it, it will help. But when you get it into your heart, you know, the scripture says in James, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourself. So we can uh, look at the word, even memorize the word, study the word. But if that word doesn't get into our heart to where it becomes a controlling factor, where it begins to lead us and guide us and teach us and correct us and educate us spiritually. Of course, the carnal mind cannot understand the things of God because it's spirit and spiritually discerned. And uh, according to Hebrews, uh, and of course, according to John chapter 1, all things were created by the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all things were made by Him, and according to Hebrews chapter 1, He upholds all things by the power of His Word. Heaven and earth shall pass away. His Word will never pass away. God's Word is eternal. It's immortal because it's, it's, it, it comes out of Him. It is, it is who He is. If you want to know who God really is, just look at the life of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus kept on declaring over and over. He said, you haven't seen the Father, but I know him, and you don't know him. He said, if you've seen me. He said, Thomas, have you known me so long and not known that me and my Father are one? So as I look in the book of Philippians, it was back in about 1981, I was complaining to the Lord. And, you know, I'm a young pastor, and I'm saying to the Lord, I said, Lord, I, uh, my heart was so heavy. I said, where's the Pauls and the Peters and the James and the Johns? Where, where are those men who walked with you and knew you and you did so many wonderful, mighty things through? And he spoke to my heart and he said this to me. He said, they're still here. I thought, what? <laughs> I said, Lord, how can they still be here? He said, uh, he said they're epistles. He said, it's a bag of seed. Uh, you know, uh, if you've got good fertile ground and you take a seed, uh, they, they discovered seed in the... Uh, uh, the pyramids of Egypt that were uh, encased uh, with the dead pharaohs that had been laying there for thousands of years, they took that seed, put it in a good soil, and guess what? It sprang forth and still produced. And that seed was thousands of years old. And, and so the word of God will still give the same results that they had in the early church. Uh, he sent his word and he healed them and delivered from all their destructions. Now, for three and a half years, Jesus, what did he do? He poured his life into those disciples. You've seen some results, but really it was God sowing seed into the hearts for the day would come when they got born again and filled with the Holy Ghost when the Bible calls the early rain came. And so for three and a half years, Jesus poured into them. And that's, you know, there's 50 parables that uh, Jesus revealed the mysteries of the kingdom to his disciples and not, not including everything else Jesus taught them and, uh, and the things they saw and the things they heard and the things they experienced. So after the resurrection of Christ, after the new birth, after the day of Pentecost, all of a sudden you saw the church. Be, those men and women began to walk in the same realm in the same dimension that Jesus did. Uh, you know, it says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, forever. And if he ever did it once, he'll do it again. Uh, he, I said he'll do it again. Yes. But that, but that, there's, there's got to be a transformation, a renewing of our mind, a re-education. 
Uh, I mean, all the stuff that I was taught till I got born again at 19 years old. I was never really taught anything about true Christianity. I had a little bit of an understanding of who Christ was, that he was born of a virgin, that he was sinless, that he died, uh, that he suffered, and that he rose again. But I didn't have any really deep concept of it. It was all in my head. But when I got born again, I picked up my Bible, and I just began to meditate upon the Word of God night and day. Now, like I said, just memorizing scripture, because uh, back over 20 years ago, I memorized nine epistles, uh, and then I picked up more epistles, and I've memorized a lot more scripture since then, but you know, just knowing those scriptures in your head doesn't change you. Uh, see, the word of God's got to be quickened. It's the spirit that quickens, the flesh profiteth nothing. Jesus said, the words I speak unto you, they are spirit in your life. And to get that word to become alive in your heart, it takes work. You, you got to soak in it. You got to meditate in it. Uh, I've done a couple of videos online about what it means to meditate, but I'm going to be doing more scripture, more, more of those scriptures online and showing you because a lot of people really, really, really do not understand what meditation is. And I'm not talking about the oriental uh, uh, aspect of, uh, of, of meditation. They think that you empty your brain. No, a, a true meditation, it, it's like you, if you pickle anything, whether it be uh, pickled beets or, or, or uh, uh, hard-boiled eggs or, or pig's feet, because <laughs> I grew up eating pig's feet, pickled pig's feet. A lot of people say, that's ah, gross. So you, uh, don't, don't, don't attack it till you try it. <laughs> and, uh, but it was pickled. It, it had a soak. It had to be saturated in that solution for a long time. It's the same thing with the Word of God. You have got to uh, pickle yourself in the Word of God. You got to saturate yourself in the Word of God. And you can do it a number of ways. You, you, you do it by listening to the same set of scriptures over and over and over and over. And as you do that, all of a sudden something, something begins to happen in your heart. Uh, you can speak it to yourself over and over and over. You can sing it. You can think on it. These are all ways that God has given to us. But as you and I look in the book of Philippians tonight, because Paul has written, writing to the Philippians, and I'm just going to basically take us to about three main sets of scriptures. So in Philippians chapter 2, verse 1, it says, and Paul, is, and, and remember, there was no chapters and verses when Paul wrote this. It was a letter to the Philippians. And now I got to thinking about this too. You understand that there's not 50 different letters to the Philippians in the Bible. There's one letter to the Philippians, one letter to the Ephesians, two letters, you know, to the Corinthians, uh, uh, one to the Romans. And so Paul wrote about uh, two thirds of the New Testament. And, and, and if I was really, really, really going to want to help somebody and I was only going to write them a lot, one letter, I'd, I'd write that letter so full of truth, so full of a uh, 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 power, so full of revelation that it, it's almost like a concentrate. You can't. You just and, and like I said, I memorized the book of Philippians over 20 years ago, and it's like it's new every time I pick it up, every time I look at it. It's like I'm overwhelmed with it. And a lot of those scriptures that I like to really meditate on are scriptures that, that just really quicken in my heart. And he begins in Philippians chapter 2, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, and if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, fulfill ye my love. Fulfill you my joy, that you be, notice, that you be like-minded. That you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. So this is so important. You need to see what Paul is trying to do with the Philippians. He's trying to help them, isn't he? He's trying to give them what they need to succeed. You know, that's what God did to Joshua in Joshua chapter, uh, when he told him, he said, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you will meditate there in day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shall make thy way prosperous, and then thou shall have good success. So throughout the Old Testament, there's many scriptures that encourage us to hide the word of God in our heart. And the fact that when we get that word of God hid in our heart, it opens the door to a place of of, of mind-boggling success, true prosperity, not prosperity of materialistical things, but prosperity in the sense of fulfilling the will of God or giving expression to the nature of God, the character of God, to be transformed. You know, you and I could really desire to be changed, but it's like Paul said in Romans chapter 7, he said, the things I, I, I don't want to do, I end up doing, and the things I want to do, I can't do. Who shall deliver me from this body of sin? And then he said this, thank God through Jesus Christ. 
So all, all scripture points to Jesus Christ, even in the old covenant. In the new covenant alone, and I have a 1611 Bible out there uh, that is not copyrighted, and I took that and I went through it and I highlighted every time it referred to Jesus, and there's approximately a little bit less than 10,000 scriptures in the New Testament, and it, the, Jesus is revealed to us almost 10,000 times. So if you take a look at that 1611, you flip it open, and all of a sudden you'll just see, and I, I didn't do it in color because it would have been $25 a book. So I highlighted it in like a gray shadow, but Jesus stands out everywhere. And he says, notice what he says. He says that, fulfill you my joy, that you be like-minded. You know, if two be not agreed together, they can't walk together. So the body, the church, the bride, the saints, we're supposed to be like-minded. There is not supposed to be over 300 denominations, not including all the independent churches. Actually, there ain't supposed to be any denominations. <laughs> There's supposed to be one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one body, one God and Father of all, above all, through all, in you all. We're all supposed to be one in Christ. So what, what was going to bring this oneness to the Philippians uh, that he says, it's it, that, that fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded. You have the same mind, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, one mind. And what is that mind? It's called the mind of Christ. You know, if you take a look at uh, any successful corporation or football team or basketball team or hockey team, or they, they all get one mind. They all discover their places, and they're all in total cooperation. Um, you know, it, it says kingdom divided against the self will fall. Uh, it's like in the marriage. It, it's, it, if we all get one mind of how this thing is supposed to work in our marriage, we'll have heaven in our home. What brings division? What brings divorce? What brings, what brings uh, destruction when we're not of one mind? Okay, so if my wife and I, we've been going, we've been married 42 years, going 43 years, what brings harmony in our home is not my opinion or her opinion, but what does the word of God say? And then I find out where my place is and I keep my nose to my grindstone. I don't try to push her nose into her grindstone. <laughs> I'll be in trouble. <laughs> That's not my job. My job is to be transformed and to fulfill the will of God when it comes to how I treat my wife. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So it says we have to be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. And then verse 3, let nothing, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Hey, you know what? America would be like heaven on earth if the politicians and those in governmental positions would get a hold of this. Think about it. <laughs> Think about it. Let nothing, say nothing. nothing. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Meism. Me, myself, and I. <laughs> but in lowliness of mind, what do you mean loneliness of mind? Well, remember the Beatitudes, blessed are the, 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 the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are they that are humble. Blessed are the meek. That's what it's talking about. You'll be blessed if you have this mind. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other, listen to this, better than themselves. For in other words, have this mind. Now, are you saying so-and-so is better than me, Pastor Mike? No, no, but have this kind of attitude. Uh, look, put people in a position where to you they're better than you. Hmm. That's why he says treat others as you'd have them treat you, right? And, and the, 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 what's the law? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, strength, mind, and being, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So I, I'm supposed to treat others better than I treat myself. I, I've, I've tried to live that life over 45, going on 46 years this February, try to treat better people better i've done i've done things for people in a better sense than i would have done for myself many times so i'll be honest there's been times i've been guilty when i wanted the biggest piece of pie or the biggest piece of pizza or i wanted the most amount of steak i still struggle with that <laughs> especially if i bought it <laughs> you know but it says in lowliness of mind esteem others better than yourselves look at look not every man on his own things 
but every man also on the things of others. Now, that doesn't mean you're supposed to be coveting your neighbor's goods, what it means. And this is such a mouthful. See, it's one thing to preach it, to say it, to speak it. It's another thing to put it to work in your life. And that's where you go, help, Jesus. <laughs> Because without me, you can do nothing, Jesus said. So I need his help to put to work these things we're talking about tonight. It says, let this mind, let it be in you or take a hold of it. Make it, make it the desire of your heart. You know, God will give you the desires of your heart. So make this a desire of your heart. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you. Now, this is the mind of Christ, by the way, from Matthew all the way to the end of the book of Revelation. And the old covenant is also the mind of God. You just got to understand the difference between the Levitical laws that have been fulfilled, uh, the uh, you know the the Mosaic laws, and uh, but there's a lot of there's a lot of good good teaching in the old covenant that we need to apply. Not the keeping of feast days, holy days, new moon days, circumcision, or things like this. You understand? Let nothing, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man in his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And then it says this, let this mind be in you, which also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God. Now, let me just tell you right now, Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus was God in the flesh. John, many scriptures that tells us all things that were created, visible and invisible, were made by him. In the beginning was the word and word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. It's what we call the triunity of God, the Father, the Son, and Holy Ghost. And Jesus is the one who spoke it into existence. Jesus is the voice of the Father. And uh, it says, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He, he, he was equal to the Father. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But guess what they do? They willingly submit themselves to one another. Uh, Jesus submits himself to the Father. And Christ also submitted himself to the voice of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit only spoke what the Father told him to speak. It says, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. For in other words, all things were made by him. Without him was nothing made that was made. And yet he, had, he took upon himself this heart, this mindset, this attitude of a servant. I mean, that's one of the greatest expressions of true Christianity is that you become a servant. You don't become a master or a lord. You don't, want pe you don't snap your fingers and want people to do what you want. You don't throw a hissy fit when it doesn't go your way. And it says, but made himself of no reputation. When he came into this earth, the Bible says in Isaiah that there was nothing that we should desire about him. He was humble and lowly and meek. Um, he said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in where? In heart. There was not one, the, 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 greatest, the, the greatest expression of the demonic DNA of the enemy that entered into the human race is pride. Pride, meism. Pride goeth before destruction and the Holy Spirit before a fall. I, I've told you, I, 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 I've counseled people through the years. I don't do too much counseling anymore when it comes to marriage. But, but I, I discovered something that really I'm in the driver's seat when it comes to my relationship with my wife. And that if I will, and I'm, I'm not talking about being a pacifist or a girly boy. I'm not talking about being a pushover. I'm saying that if I am meek and humble, if I am gentle and kind and loving and forgiving and merciful and help, helpful, that, that God will be in my home. I mean, even if I'm married to a woman that ain't right with God, he'll still be in my home. He'll be in me. <laughs> That's the expression of Jesus. But made himself of no reputation. He had a right to. He was God. Everybody should have fell down and worshiped him. Matter of fact, I can prove he was God. When the wise men finally found Jesus, they worshiped him. The shepherds worshiped him. And the Bible says, I shall worship the Lord thy God in him only. He was God. Don't, any doctrine that tells you otherwise, run away from. Because if he was not God, then he would, would not have been able to take all the sins of the world. Think about it. He took all of the sins of the world upon him. As he, uh, on that night, he was betrayed by Judas and headed to the cross. 
but made himself of no reputation. It took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, now look at what he does. He humbles himself and became obedient unto death. And then it says either, even the death of the cross. The, 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 the crucifixion of Christ. See, in the old covenant, they, they, uh, they would hang those who were cursed upon a tree. And all the cursings came upon them. Jesus was made a curse that you and I might be made a blessing. He was made sin that we might be made righteous. Jesus, God himself in the flesh, think about this, took your place of punishment. The wrath of God was upon Jesus. He took my place on the cross. I deserved, and then his soul, according to what Paul, Peter said in, 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 in the book of Acts, and, and Paul talks about it, that his soul, his soul, not his spirit, his spirit ascended to heaven. He said, into thy hands command on my spirit. His soul went to hell for three days. He went where you and I should have gone forever, but he was only there for three days. Why? Because there was no sin in him. He was made sin, but he never committed sin. I got the thing. I like to meditate on this kind of stuff because I was thinking that many times we, we sin in word and deed and thought and action and, and motive. But anytime you knowingly, willingly step out of the will of God, no matter what you watch, what you read, what you say, your attitude, your opinions, your feelings, that is sin. Jesus not once from the time he was conceived into the time he was resurrected, ever committed even the smallest of sins. Wow. I, I just, it's hard for, because it, it says, uh, the very heavens are filthy before man, before God, how much more man that drinketh iniquity like it's water. I mean, we're, the, 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 that spirit of rebellion is so strong in us. But Jesus did never sin once. And he went to the cross willingly. In the garden, he was sweating as it was, great drops of blood. And he, he said, not my will, but your will be done. He said, Father, if there's a way. And, and the reason why he was under so much pressure, because you understand, Jesus had never known sin. Of course, before he became the firstborn, he was first begotten from the dead also, because he was born again in hell. And, and, and his, his soul was made alive in hell. His soul died. And he rose again on the third day. And he overcame principle. See, Jesus did not overcome demonic powers in hell. Uh, I know a lot of people teach this stuff. Demonic powers are not in hell. As a matter of fact, the devils even said to Jesus when he was casting the devils out of the Gadarean, he said, have you, have you come to uh, punish us before our time? They knew there was a timetable. How many know the devil's timetable is running out? And that's why he's filled with great wrath. We are coming into the time of the Antichrist. Now, there's many Antichrists in the world, but we're coming into that time. I'm finishing a book right now. It's called 101 Signs of the Return of Christ, 101 Signs. We are right on the edge of the return of Christ. But before that day can come, according to 2 Thessalonians, the man of perdition must be revealed who opposes all and exalts itself above all that is called God or that is worshipped as God. And we are coming into the very end, but devils are not in hell. Uh, there's angels locked up underneath the river Euphrates, but they're in the, they're, they're principalities and powers and rulers of darkness in high places. They're in the atmosphere between, between the earth and heaven. And Jesus, when he was raised from the dead, overcame principalities and powers, and he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. The angelic host and all the saints saw Jesus overcome the devil as he was rising from the dead. I, 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 if you and I could have seen in the realm of the spirit the day that Christ came out of that tomb, you'd have been shocked at all the demonic powers that were screaming in there trying to prevent him because they knew that he was going to, it, it says he took the blood and he took it into the mercy seat. There was a mercy seat in heaven. The mercy seat on earth is a type in the shadow. And he took it into the heavenlies and he applied his blood on the mercy seat in heaven in the holy of holies for the redemption of those who would believe and trust in him. I, I'm pretty myself happy now 
I really am, man. I was lost and undone until I opened the door to my, to, of my heart to Christ. And then when he came in, he wanted to bring in revelation. He wanted to bring in healing. He wanted to see when Christ came into your heart, he didn't come into you to let you live a mundane, boring, dead, defeated life. He came in to bring you into the same place he's at to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And we've already been blessed with all spiritual blessings. And, you know, people are trying to get blessings and they don't understand they're already blessed. You just got to take it by faith. Reach up and grab that. You got to take it by faith, man. You got to believe. And it says in being found in fashion as a man, he humbled. He humbled himself. You and I are going to have to humble ourselves. You and I are going to find ourselves in predicaments where we're being mistreated and we're not being understood. We're being, we're, we're being taken advantage of. And that doesn't mean to just let the devil take advantage of. I'm not talking about the devil, but there's times when God just says, zip the lip. Go ahead. Let him attack you. Let him accuse you. Let him find fault with you. That's what Jesus did when he was before Pilate. Well, because God is the judge of all. And God is able to deliver you. And it says here, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, uh, Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live it, not I, but it's Christ that lives within me. I need to be crucified. And, and, and I can't crucify you because that would be murder. <laughs> and when we try to change people, we're murdering them. If I'm trying to mold and shape my wife into my likeness and my image, that'd be kind of ugly anyways. I wouldn't want to be married to me. But if I just let my wife be who she is and let God deal with her, and I'll just take up my cross. Sometimes your cross is just to grin and bear it. <laughs> Have you learned that yet? I mean, when I was young in the faith, I would try to correct everybody. Anytime they spoke a doctrine that was contrary to the Bible, and the Lord said, uh, you, you, do you think you're the Holy Ghost? I said, no. He said, just shut your mouth until I tell you to open it. Now, he didn't say it so nasty, <laughs> but he said, you need to close your mouth. Because uh, you just make, there's times that I was, I was spewing biblical truth, but I, I just, all I did was harden people's hearts. I got to let God deal with them. It, it, Jesus said, unless my father draws you, you won't come. And, and there's people, let's admit it, there's people that are not going to come. Because they love this world. They love the darkness. They love it. They revel in it. They, level, they revel in evil. I know because I was there at one time. And God set me free. Wherefore God, no notice, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The Father didn't make him go. God's not going to make you do anything. God's not going to make you obey the word. During this COVID, I don't believe at all it was ever the will of God for the body of Christ to stop gathering out of the fear of getting COVID. I don't believe it. I don't see it anywhere in the Bible. Well, aren't you supposed to obey the laws of the land as long as they don't contradict the, what the Bible says? Now, there's places that people ought to just kick the dust off their feet and leave. Because that's what Jesus said. You go into a city, you go into a town, you go into an area, and you preach the gospel. And if they reject what you have today, just kick the dust off your feet and, and leave them. And the Bible says it'll be worse for them than it was for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment. I didn't say this, okay? So, but I'm going to obey God. Now, my job isn't going to put pressure on you to obey God. I'm not demeaning people because I've missed God many times in my life and thank God for his mercy. But my job is to obey God. And when I miss it, I got to repent and acknowledge it and say, God, help me to do what's right. Wherefore, God also, because he humbled himself, wherefore, because he gave himself to the cross, wherefore, God also has highly exalted him. Say highly he is high, and throughout the epistles, it reveals this revelation of how Christ is above all. He, the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwells in Christ. A lot of these things, I don't understand it with my mind. You know, just like in the world, if you don't understand uh, addition and subtraction, you won't understand multiplication, and you won't understand algebra, and you definitely won't understand trigonometry. And, and, you know, these are, these are spiritual revelations that only God can give. And who does he do? Get? Blessed are that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Yeah. If, people, if people aren't hungry for spiritual truth, you'll put them to sleep preaching with the most dynamic preaching you can imagine. Because to them, it don't mean a thing. I know my wife, she's really into uh, uh, sewing and, 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 and my daughter's into quilting. And you know what though, if I was to go to the one of those women's meetings about how to do patterns and how to make this, and I'd lose my mind. I'd be, I'd be bored out of my, I'd just be, you know, I, 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 I'd just be playing with my fingernails. 
You know what I'm saying? And, and because it's not a hunger in my heart. Well, it's the same thing spiritually. If people are not spiritually hunger, hungry, you, you can't really help them. You, you got to maintain your spiritual hunger. And you can lose your spiritual hunger. How? By what? By filling your heart and your mind with stuff that is foolish. And you'll lose your hunger for God. I've seen it over and over. Very little hunger for God. Very little. Well, how do I know if I'm hungry for God? Well, let me say, if, if, if you're hungry for steak, I know the other day somebody gave my wife and I a card to uh, Outback Steakhouse. And we haven't ate there for years, you know, because we got a steakhouse in Chambersburg. And, and, and the day before Christmas, we went shopping. And I said, come on, baby, let's go to Maryland. We looked up and, and the restaurants were open in Maryland. <laughs> And so, so we went to Outback Steakhouse, and the card had $25 in it, so we got two appetizers. Of course, it couldn't pay our cost. And my wife says, honey, you're spending too much money on you. I said, baby, you're worth it. And I got the biggest steak they had. <laughs> And I ate most of it. You know why? Because I was hungry for steak. Now, she was over there eating her salmon. She kept offering me her salmon. Guess what? What did I do, baby? I turned you down. I didn't want salmon. I was a salmon fisherman up in Alaska. I had enough salmon to last me 100 lifetimes. I don't care about salmon. I used to pull them salmon in, uh, off of the Bristol Bay and off of Oregon. I worked in the fishing industry. And, and, and where I don't care about that. But I'll take that steak. Now, maybe if I was a cattleman, I wouldn't eat it. I don't know. But I wanted that steak. Well, you didn't have to force me to eat that. And if you tried to force me to eat that steak, I would have spit it out. She, if she tried to force, and she actually did. She took a piece of salmon and tried to shove it over my face. I said, get that. I didn't say it this way, but I was thinking, get that out of my face. I don't want that slimy fish. <laughs> I want some good old red steak. And I eat it medium rare, just enough before you can hear the moo. <laughs> I like my steak, okay? It's the same thing with the word of God. I love love the word of God. I love the word of God. I'd rather hear good preaching any day than, 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 I mean, I thank God for good Christian music, but I love the teaching of God's word. If it's quickened by the spirit and if it's really of the Holy Ghost, okay? Wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name that the name of Jesus, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow mm. every knee every knee the, every knee this says that the name of jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth every knee would bow so everything that has a name has to bow cancer has to bow its knees i've seen it in my own body when i had a three-month fight against colon cancer didn't use the medical world, didn't use medication, didn't take chemo. I told it to bow its knees. Took three months, it looked like I was gonna die, but guess what, it bowed its knees. I did that when I shattered my kneecap, my right kneecap, on a snowmobile accident. And it took a couple weeks, but it bowed its knees and my knee supernaturally reattached itself. When I broke my foot, and I slammed my foot down as hard as I could five times. And the fifth time, that broken, busted ankle and foot was instantly healed. My wife and our staff saw it. See, I said, bow your knees, broken foot, in Jesus' name. You have to obey the word of God. I did it with a hernia uh, when I was putting up this building. And uh, for, I had it for almost three years. My wife said it was two. I think it was three. And, it was, and I would speak to it passively. And I would tell her to be healed. But it got to the place where I know it was going to get strangled. And I began to get aggressive. I said, no, you got to bow your knee. And I took it and I shoved it up inside. And I just keep shoving it up. And in about two weeks, I went to bed one night, woke up the next morning, and it was gone. And that was probably over 30-some years ago. Uh, brother, Pastor Pete did it when he had cancer on his forehead. And the first time he had it removed. And the second time he said, enough's enough. And he began to tell that cancer, you got to go in Jesus' name. His brother had went through a terrible ordeal with the same kind of cancer, didn't he, Pete? And one day, and, and, and not a very long, was it? Just a couple of weeks or a week, Pete? He had it the same time as I did. But when did it fall off? How long did you have it before it fell off? The second time. Less than probably two days. Two days, three days, he told it. Wow. Now people say, I don't believe that. Well, that's why you don't get it. Two days. Now, I'll tell you right now, knowing Pete, if it had gone on for a month, he would have just kept on taking a hold of God for a month. Two months, three months, he would have just kept, guess what, though? It fell off. Just, he brushed his head. Boom, it fell off. 
See, we have power. Every knee shall bow at, at the man. Now, this sounds like, well, this is weird Christianity. You know, it's biblical Christianity. <laughs> Read the book of Acts. Jesus said, Behold, I give unto you power to tread upon snakes and scorpions and over all the power, over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means come to harm you. Well, how come I don't have that? Well, you've got to have the mind of Christ. See, the mind of Christ is not just an attitude. It's the fact that he was full of nothing but the truth, wasn't he? He was full of truth. And the more full of the truth. See, whatever part of your life is not full of truth, it's full of lies, ain't it? It's either you got the truth or you got lies. You know, you're, you're, whether it's attacking your feelings. Hey, listen, in I've got feelings. I've got emotions. I've got a physical body. I, and the devil attacks my feelings. He attacks my emotions. I was manic depressant before I got saved, suicidal, tried to commit suicide a number of times. And the day I got born again, I was in the process of slicing my wrist. When the fear of God fell on me on my 19th birthday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, February 18th, 1975. And I dropped the knife, fell to my knees. I cried out to Jesus and I jumped up off the floor, a brand new creation. <laughs> <laughs> and I began to renew my mind. I began to rip out all the old lies and began to put in truth. And it radically transformed me. I didn't even know this kind of life existed, people. I didn't even know. I believed in miracles because I was a Catholic, you know, which is really an advantage. I'm telling you what, Catholics believe more in miracles than the fundamentalists do. And, and, and I had a lot of wrong doctrine, but I, I didn't have a lot of wrong doctrine because I didn't really listen a lot to the priests and the nuns, you know. <laughs> but when I got born again, I believed in miracles, and I just started reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I stepped into the realm of the supernatural and miraculous, and I began to have encounters with God. Why? Because I just had a simple heart. I'm just a simple person. I'm not a real deep thinker. I'm not analytical. As I look out there, I can tell some of you are extremely analytical, and that gets you into trouble. It'll keep you out from where God wants you to live. And we don't have to think about it. We don't have to understand it. We believe it. And then the understanding comes. So I'm say again, after you believe, you get born again. After you believe, you get baptized in the Holy Ghost, speaking in the heavenly language. After you believe, the healing will be manifested. After you believe, after you believe, and then the miracles come. Okay, and it says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, things in heaven, things in earth, and things on the earth, and that every tongue, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, of course, I didn't get into the other set of scriptures I wanted to tonight because this, I'm telling you, this stuff is so real, so powerful, so awesome. I can usually preach a month on the book of Philippians because we're not even dissecting it. We're not even looking at it in a deeper way. It's just there for us. Say it's there for me. And it depends upon how much you give yourself to it. Uh, if you give yourself to the truth, give yourself to the word, give yourself to the will of the Father. And, and yes, you're going to have a struggle in this world because, and especially now with technology, we've got a, in this world today, I know I was ordained through Dr. Lester Summer. I don't know if he, you know who he was. He went to be home with the Lord many years ago. But he said, you cannot do everything God has done for you in your life in a matter of minutes by yielding your mind to the wrong stuff and we it says protect your heart for out of it flows the issues of life and and you gotta you say well i've really messed up pastor mike welcome to the mess up party <laughs> that's why we need help <laughs> jesus i need you I, I i you know we sing that song i need you more today than i did yesterday i i need him and now man i'm telling you what uh <clears throat> with what's going on but the good news is you can also feed your heart and your mind I, I know most nights my wife and i'll lay in bed and she puts the bible on most nights many times in the morning i'll wake up and she's got the bible on uh, well now i get out of bed for she does but i'll come back to bed later on i'll you like up this morning i, I woke up at about four o'clock just laying in my bed praying and i got up and i prayed and i came over to the church and i discovered i had forgot to open up the water faucet so our lines froze but thank god they're on thawed now <laughs> they're thawed out <laughs> not on thawed they're thawed out and I went back, prayed some more, and crawled back into bed. <laughs> you know, but she had the word of God playing when I came back to bed. So I want, as we finish up here tonight, and I want you to notice in verse 12, wherefore, my beloved, as you listen to this, what a conviction this gives to me. You know, in Philippians chapter 1, Paul said, I have nobody like Timothy because all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. He's talking about his whole team. 
He said, I don't have nobody. Timothy was a man who was singly minded, fixed on the will of God. And the other team members, he didn't say they, they went to hell. He just said, I don't have nobody. He, he, that's like Timothy. He said, this guy is obsessed with truth. Say, Lord, help me <laughs> be obsessed with truth. <laughs> Why? Because you'll know the truth and the truth will do what? Set you free from what? Fear, worry, anxiety, hate, bitterness, lust, a, a poor me attitude. You'll be victorious, right? We're more than conquerors. We're for my beloved as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence. Listen, but now much so, so more in my absence. We're for beloved as you have always obeyed, not as my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation. Take a hold of that my salvation work out your own salvation with fear and trembling oh i prayed a prayer i'm good to go pastor mike well you don't believe you don't read the same bible i he that endureth to the end will be saved that's what jesus said Me, read matthew he is what's your eschatology pastor mike read matthew 24 25 that's my eschatology what jesus said about the end days but now much more in my absence working out your own salvation with what fear and trembling Fear and trembling. Why? Because you can live your whole life for God and find yourself in hell at the end of your life if you don't watch it. You can know the truth and still go to hell because you're not living it. You're not doing it. You're not working out your salvation. You're not walking in the fear of the Lord. And it says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Why? For it is God which worketh in you to do what? Both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing in you to bring to pass the will of the Father and to do his good pleasure in your life. Um, it says in the last days, there's gonna be many, many, many false prophets, multitudes. In the days of Jeremiah, in the days of Isaiah, in the days of Ezekiel, there was just a small handful of true prophets. The rest of them were just a bunch of lying, deceiving, self-pleasing, people i'm not judging nobody's heart i just got to keep my nose clean but i'll tell you what there's a lot of preaching out there today that will just tell you god loves you just the way you are god loves you just the way you are no uh, god so loved the world he gave his son in order to bring transformation to you he wants to change you why do you think you got born again i mean come on that's like uh, we can't wait till our, our uh, uh, my, my wife and i have have a baby really you just want a baby just give birth to a baby. Is that really the end? How I many know oh, that's just the beginning? <laughs> we had five. That's just the beginning. You got a lot of work ahead of you now. The born again experience, that's just the beginning of your salvation. Now, at that moment, you're born again. But how I many know that baby, from the moment the woman gets pregnant to the moment she gives birth, she, she, can, have an, she can have a miscarriage. Yep, she could. She could even abort it. You know how many people I've known it talks about the sower who sows the seed. We won't get into that tonight. But a lot of people get born again and they abort the life of God within them. You know why? Because they won't change their, what they're reading, what they're watching, what they're eating spiritually, what they're doing. Because uh, you got a gospel that doesn't preach repent. Repent. For when repent means to change your mind and do it God's way. God, I know there's a way which seems right unto man, but then thereof is the way of death. I'm going to do it your way, God. Let's pray. Father, help us now. Lord, even as the psalmist said, Lord, examine my heart to see if there be any wicked way in us. Lord, many of us don't have to dig very deep. We know we can't live right, do right, speak right, think right without you. Without you, you said we can do nothing. We can't do it without your help, Lord. So, Lord, we pray. Just pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I acknowledge that without you, I can do nothing right. You are the vine, and I am a branch. Help me to abide in you. Give me a hunger, a thirst, a yearning to know you more than I've ever known you before. Take me deeper. Take me, deeper. Take me, higher. Take me higher. Broaden my horizon. Broaden my horizon. Give, me Give me a revelation of who you really are, who you really are. That, I may that I may 
give you all of my heart to love you with all of my soul, my strength, and my mind, and my being. In Jesus' name. Mm. Amen. Amen. <laughs>